Hello to the chicos and the chicas, back to chess education. Um, today on the menu is going to be a request from Twitter. I put out a Twitter yesterday asking the chess punks community to recommend ideas for me to make a YouTube video about. I received many responses. Quite a few of them were actually very exciting. I'm going to present to you one of them now. I am going to keep the rest um, in reserve. And that was a request by... Tom Ash, who said that converting a space advantage into a win could be a topic, asking as I mucked up uh, in a tournament a few weeks ago when I drew as black from a position, the engine evaluated as minus four and I couldn't find the route through. So I decided to pick this because I asked him to show me the game and he did. So we have got the game at hand and this, by the way, is a very important starting point that um, very often... Um, the best answer can only be given in context. And so once we see the game, we have a clearer vision and idea about what went wrong and how we can address this. So let's uh, kick off. We are in the black trunks. It is a trump and I'm going to blitz through the opening. In fact, I'm only playing through the opening because I want you to have a rough idea about how the um, middle game scenario occurred that we are going to discuss in detail. Nothing really to report on a few weird moves on both sides. Um, and seemingly neither side really know how to make progress in this position. And this is where I would probably start the discussion with Black's pawn c5, because he white played a move that I'm sure that a lot of club level players could relate to and would say that, yeah, that's the move I would play too, which was d5, which in my book is a tragic positional blunder, no less. And the reason for that is, is because whilst the move seemingly gains space, it entirely destroys the position in the sense that now white has absolutely nothing to play for. Now, having said that, it's also not easy to find a constructive plan to play for um, without pushing in, but to give you a scenario, I could play rook d1, I could drop the bishop back, perhaps double up even on the d, then take, and then use the d5 square as well as the d file to operate alongside, and in my opinion, white would definitely not be worse there. However, what we um, observe after d5 is, is that white is utterly and hopelessly planless and has got a miserable bishop. And usually uh, they say in similar scenarios that, oh no, white has got a plan, it's e4. And uh, even if that comes through, and again, it's not going to happen because black immediately played knight e4, by the way. But even if we have a look at this structure, we realize that this is again, utter misery for white. Because this bishop is just walled in behind this mass of pawns. And black's bad bishop, the supposedly bad bishop on g7, is quite a potent attacker on this diagonal. This diagonal can grab the d4 square to target down that way. So black is just all kinds of better here. And so the whole entire story from d5-1 is a dead end for white. But we struggle. And we struggle to convert, so we need to see what went wrong key for black. Knight d4 was played, take, take, knight d2, and f5. And as soon as this position occurred on the board, black, in my opinion, needed to have a bit of a chat with himself about how we are going to convert this. The main feature of the position remains the same as before, after d5, and that is none other than white has simply no plan whatsoever. The pawn structure indicates that white should be playing on the queen side, except it's completely clocked up. Black, on the other hand, is very clearly about to launch a kingside assault. Now, what does this attack look like? Because very clearly, we need to make a pawn break here. And that pawn break needs to be by definition, because that's the easiest one to accomplish, and in fact, we can't really push our pawns up without playing f4. So what we want to do is to break the king side with f4, opening files and diagonals. That is how we are going to convert this. Let's see what happened. Knight e2 was played. Obviously, white is keeping an eye on this f4 push. g5, I'm all for it. Brilliant. No worries. Knight f1, white is struggling, great news. Rook e7, no problems. I guess the other rook is going to come to f8, looking like a million dollars. Great stuff. Um, f4, 
is threatened. Queen d2, and we played h5. That is the first move that I find a little bit difficult to relate to, because it seems to me that we lost sight of the plan. And I don't like that, because these positions very clearly have a logic of plan execution type of nature. Additionally to that, by the way, our pieces are not ready for f4 yet in the sense that the queen is completely shut out of the business. So here I would have considered playing queen d8 and bringing the queen to the king side before I lunge forward with f4. H5 is not a bad move, but it's a bit of a mystery as to what black wants to accomplish there. So this is the first point where if I'm the coach, I would be like, what's the plan, man? Like, what are we playing for? Because the last few moves really did look like F4, F4. We are just constantly saying F4, F4, F4. And then white puts up the slightest resistance. Then we go like, ah, no, nah, something else. That's not how it works. We need to force f4 in and it's totally doable okay let's go h5 uh, knight g3 oh lord h4 knight back happy days now the funny thing is is that now the position is so darn good because after h5 which was definitely not bad but a little bit of a, a stab in the dark white managed to play two absolutely utterly meaningless moves so now we are back to square one again and we go like what's our plan f4 right is it good to go and if you are not asking this question from yourself you are not playing the game crude cruel but true is f4 good to go or not because if f4 is good to go we pull the trigger oh no it's hanging that's everyone's answer about up to 1800 1900 take your pick depending on the style, may up to 2,000. I can't go because EF, GF, Knight, F4, at which coach, by the way, would step in and like, hang on, that's where it starts, right? So now we start calculating. That's your starting point, not your calling off point. That's when we engage, because that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to play F4 to open up files and diagonals. We just did that. How could we call it off here? Right? That doesn't make any sense. It's like winning the lotto and then not spending the money. Like, the purpose was not to win it. The purpose was to then do something with it, right? So, F4 is a means to an end. It's not the end. And here, after F4, we have an absolutely brutal attack. Absolute total carnage. In fact, it's game over. Like, we can sign score sheets, walk away. Well done. Next round, please. Because G3... Is met by bishop takes pawn takes rook check king h1 bishop g4 and uh, the bishop f3 matutski can only be held by severe material losses now to demonstrate the strength of this idea please take a casual note that i left the queen completely out of the whole shebang like we didn't even do what i deemed for earlier on to be necessary to bring the queen across and it's still a great idea by the way queen here and then rook, F, uh, rook e f7, queen e7, or queen e8, queen f7, queen e8, queen g6. Myriads of ways to prepare f4. Now, let's assume that we are not strong enough players to see that f4 does in fact completely mops up the board. So how do we then not play here bishop e5? Because, and again, I'm running with what he's doing here. So, once again, if I was coach and he played bishop f6, I would be lost for words here. Like, what are you doing, bro? Like, we played five moves to get f4 in. And now we are virtually one move away from executing the decisive break. And we go like, nah, I actually have a better idea. Actually, I don't even know what the idea is with bishop f6, so I need to take that back. But look at this. You need to be consistent. Like, you have to just follow through with the plan. Bishop e5. How do they stop f4? And g3 is an eyesore of a move. Immediately jumping in. Bishop e8, bishop h5, bishop f3. And white's position looks like some top quality Swiss cheese. 
it's utterly unplayable. By the way, no DF1 knight that has zero squares to go to. That is a spectacle in itself. Wow, look at that. That's that's epic. That uh, White has got two minor pieces, and the two combined have a grand total of one legal move. <laughs> that's just uh, about uh, Bishop E5 and its uh, power that forces G3. Or if they don't, then F4. And we just roll on, and once again, we just push, push, push until we crack the files and the diagonal is open. And then naturally what's going to happen is, is that our pieces will be far better placed to carry out a decisive attack than their pieces in order to... I wish I knew how to do red. Wait. Oh, that's how you do red. Um, to partake in the defense. So, bishop f6 is the most mind-boggling move to me. I have absolutely zero idea what it is. In fact, I would suspect it was a mouse slip, were it not for the fact that this was an over-the-board game. Yeah, this this is remarkable. Anyway, uh, rook h7, I don't know what we're doing. Like, I'm, I'm really lost here as to what the plan is. And so I'm going to keep coming back to f4 because this is very clearly the key moment in the game where black somehow lost sight of the target. Which is pretty straightforward. We need f4. And what I also don't understand here is, is that there are so many ways to get f4 in. You could play bishop e5. You could play rook f7. Right? Now, I get it. Knight c3 and then there is a pressure on the e4 pawn. So then we need to calculate a little bit more cautiously. So maybe yeah, bishop e5 would have been my way to go about this and bring the queen up around as well. But given that f4 just mops up the board from get-go... It is just, yeah, unbelievable what's happening here. Okay, finally the queen comes around. <sighs> See, I don't, I really don't like this move. I really don't. I'm pretty sure it doesn't give away the advantage. But what I really dislike about this is the concept that we don't understand that the objective is to blast the position open. And it's quite unbelievable how often people don't understand that the very definition of opening a position is to make pawns go away. The reason why I'm wording it this way is because it can be trades or it can be sacrifice, either or. But I want pawns to be gone so that the line moving pieces have got scope to work with, right? What is the only move on the board with pawns that actually forces white to lock the position further up, h3. Now, if we do have a force mate, I'm all for this. And it does weaken the white squares a lot. So there is a lot that is going to go into the pro section. But the con section of closing the position off concerns me. Um, okay, so queen f7 was played, obviously, with the idea of queen h5, queen f3, and getting in. It's a bit of a caveman chess, but I guess... Um, Queen d1 only move. Actually, no, I'm lying. Knight move. No, a knight move would also cover because queen h5 then can be met with queen d1. And by the way, this needed to be seen before queen f7. Because if after queen f7, queen d1, we go like, bugger, they, there is no mate, then again, the whole queen f7 story is probably nowhere near as good as potentially putting the bishop in there could have been with a subsequent f4 break. Funny I should say that, right? Okay, keep going. Ooh, we are back to f4. We're back to f4. Knight d2. Okay. Um, queen g7. A little bit timid, but again, I get it. We want to exploit a discovered check. Just want to test this out very quickly. I didn't look at it, so I am now completely in the dark as well. What's f4 like here? I'm threatening to take something and then check and checkmate, yeah? So let's say they take. That seems to be the most annoying. Take, take, take. Yeah, now I feel like um, we can't break through. It seems like everything just got defended. Okay, fair enough. So now we need to do some adjustments. Potentially put a bishop on g6 before we go in with f4. Queen g7, okay, I'm going to go with that. And this is the second key moment in the game ladies and gents because f4 here is an absolutely top-end desperate measure 
And now you have got three choices, right? Take, take en passant, or ignore. Now remember, what is our goal? The goal is to open up the position where our opponent is vulnerable, which is the king side, where we have the more space. That's how we use the more space. We blast it open there. Which position, um, sorry, which move out of the three is going to be the one that allows white to keep it as close as possible? Actually, there are two competitors there for that answer. One is the complete ignore, and the other one is to take. Neither of these moves make any sense at all in my book, because our goal is to open things up. And unfortunately, for example, if I take like this, I managed to open up the G file, but since we pushed the pawn past G3, remember what I told you then about opening files, doesn't seem like a realistic target. F file is closed, E file is closed, H file is useless. We can't break through. So that's not even a candidate move yet was played. Bishop moves anywhere is just meaningless because we literally re-enter the same structure. So by just rule of uh, elimination or process of elimination, I should rather say, the only sensible move here is EF3. And quite frankly, this is a 30 second move, especially because after knight takes f3, only legal move, we immediately notice the backward pawn on e3, the semi-open e file, the diagonal that is now super duper meaningful. And it's a very, very easy game to play from here. Bishop h5, potentially forcing the capture. We take back. Now we have got a combination of multitude of threats piling up on the e file, sneaking in on the light squares, creating a mate threat, pretty much resignable really uh, on the grand scheme of things. So um, yeah, a really, really uh, a long string of very, very sad mistakes and inaccuracies allowed white to build up this position. And indeed, we went from minus four to minus 0. Point whatever now. And I don't think that this is winnable anymore, although the trade adds insult to injury, because admittedly this is uh, White's best, but this is also our best piece. And I feel like Nia we could potentially be even slightly worse if uh, this knight creates a blockade. And yeah, no, we can't be worse, but this is now not winnable anymore. And in fact, the players called it a day right here. And fair enough, I don't think that there is a slightest glimmer of hope he for black to pull through or to win the game. So, oh boy. Yeah, this, this was a painful one. And like I said, I didn't really enjoy this thing, this move. Some of the engines like it the, as best, but for me, it just goes against logic. And quite strongly too. And by the way, if H3 is our plan, and here again, cunning would have come very handy, we could have started with queen F7. Such a beautiful multi-purpose move, right? And now h3 is a game-winning threat all of a sudden because of this. But uh, my biggest pet peeve here was the missed f4 here. There is just absolutely no way that this should have needed to be omitted or shouldn't have been played or, yeah, any of the above. It's just carnage. And that's, ladies and gentlemen, how you convert... I don't know if it's better to call it. I have been long thinking about whether I should call this position space advantage as a theme or closed positions, but I suppose it's a bit of both. And um, yeah, the way you convert is that you blast the position open on the side where you have more space, therefore more mobility, therefore more superior army. I hope this guy was helpful and I'm going to still sift through the other Twitter responses because I think there are a few gems there that will make it um, to YouTube. So thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to sub, to like, to super thank me if you can and I will see you in the next video. Bye!